You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is June 11, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Immunologic Disorders of the Female and Male Reproductive Tract. Our presenter is Dr. Jonathan Bernstein. He's a professor of medicine in the Division of Allergy Immunology at the University of Cincinnati School of Medicine in Cincinnati, Ohio. Good morning, everyone. Um, This is the second hour of COLA for June 11th, uh, 2021. Um, uh, We have the privilege of having Dr. Jonathan Bernstein with us this morning. He's going to talk about immunologic disorders of the female and male reproductive tract. Um, Dr. Bernstein um, was gracious enough to give this talk a few years ago, um, and um, I wanted to do it again. We used to um, um, kind of systematically go through the body of different organ systems and how they were affected um, 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 by the immune system. And um, I think this is a great talk that Dr. Bernstein has given, and I asked him to do it again. So Dr. Bernstein is professor of medicine, Department of Internal Medicine and Division of Immunology and Allergy at the University of Cincinnati, um, Department of Internal Medicine. And I'm going to let Dr. Bernstein take it away. Thank you very much, and it's uh, good to be back. And again, this is, I think, uh, uh, what we an important talk because when we talk about the scope of practice for allergist immunologists, we have to be prepared to take care of these uh, what we consider unusual conditions that come into our office. Uh, so hopefully, we can help uh, give you uh, some comfort in terms of how to approach, evaluate. Uh, diagnose and treat these conditions. So we're going to initially start by discussing the adaptive innate immune responses, the female and genital tract, go over that briefly, and then define some of the more common clinical conditions that might be seen in the allergist office related to these conditions, to the uh, uh, male and female uh, genital tracts, and then provide some case studies that illustrate uh, how these patients present with these conditions and clinical evaluation and treatments. So let's begin about talking basic anatomy, the female genital tract. It certainly uh, consists of the upper genital tract, which is sterile and includes the fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the cervical plug, and the lower uh, genital tract, which is non-sterile, and it includes the ectoservice and the vagina. A uh, male genital tract is protected anatomically by the long urethra. Now, there are several components of the innate immune system that confer uh, protection in the genital tract. For the female, the lower uh, non-sterile female genital tract must have an efficient innate immune system to eliminate harmful microbial agents and other contaminants. And there's a number of these uh, different, uh, 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 you know, uh, proteins and so forth, receptors, uh, like natural antimicrobial peptides, we call them NAPs, uh, pattern recognition toll-like receptors, which you've learned about in your immunology uh, sections uh, that are important uh, for in diff- different types of infections, uh, defensins, complement, and then effector natural killer cells. Uh, now, NAPs, natural antimicrobial peptides, these are whey acidic protein motif containing proteins. Uh, some of the common ones are the secretory leukocyte protease inhibitors, SLPIs, and these are proteases that are that are inhibited. Uh, the proteases that are inhibited include neutrophil, elastase, tryptase, trypsin, and cathepsin G. Alafins are other forms, which are, and the proteases that are inhibited include neutrophil elastase as well and protonase 3. Uh, they prevent host uh, tissue damage by inhibiting these proteases released by gram negative and gram positive bacteria, and they reduce the host susceptibility to microbial colonization and infection, and they're found in highest concentrations in the cervical mucus and vagina where contamination is greatest. Levels may uh, fluctuate during different menstrual phases. Uh, Defensins, these are small cationic proteins divided into alpha and beta groups based on disulfide bonds. Uh, Defensins, alpha defensins are found in neutrophils. Uh, There are several human neutrophil peptides, one through four, as well as they're found on epithelial surfaces and these are the human alpha defensins 5 and 6. 
Uh, beta defenses are constitutively expressed uh, or induced after challenge with inflammatory infectious stimuli. They have chemotactic, antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral properties, which are again important for host protection. This is just an illustration showing the distribution of NAPs and defensins. In the, in the female genital tract uh, at different uh, levels, you can see uh, you, you, the uh, non-sterile part, you have uh, different NAPs, the SLPIs, the lapsins, and then uh, some of these other uh, um, defensins that are present uh, throughout uh, the uh, non-sterile part. But you also see them, obviously, in the upper uh, genital tract as well. And here is just an illustration showing how these uh, different uh, molecules, uh, proteins are, uh, you know, wh wh where they occur during the menstrual cycle because they do vary uh, throughout. You can see that some of the defensins occur early, whereas some of the, um, there, there's variability in, 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 in the uh, laffins and the SLPIs, the uh, NAPs. So they do have some variability throughout the, um, uh, and it could, again, this is all likely due to evolutionary biology because uh, it's important to have uh, more upregulation of these innate immune responses during times where there might be uh, uh, more entry of, uh, of, of you know, uh, different um, infectious agents into the systemic circulation or so through the, uh, during the secretory phase and so forth. Now, toll-like receptors recognize pathogen-associated molecular peptides. These are PAMPs, and they also DAMPs, the danger-associated peptides, and again, uniquely expressed throughout the general tract, located on uterine NK cells. Um, they respond to different ligands leading to increased cytokine and chemokine production or chemotaxis of monocytes and neutrophils in the surrounding tissue. So um, they play a significant role, and here you can see that they're expressed on epithelium uh, in different parts of the body body, including the uterine, uh, and uh, this just shows you how um, the NAPs and the defensins and toll-like receptors um, <clears throat> are expressed and wh what impact they have on uh, different uh, uh, microbial organisms uh, in terms of, you know, TLR1 and 2, you know, against bacteria, mycobacterium, whereas uh, 6 might be more involved with fungi and uh, TLR4 important for gram-negative bac uh, bacteria and so forth, and some of these other uh, TLR receptors, which actually are important against double-stranded or single-stranded viruses, uh, or you know single-stranded RNA uh, viruses, TLR8 and so forth. <coughs> uh, TLR9 is interesting because this is really uh, associated with these CPG motifs, and actually there were some therapies being developed previously related to CPG motifs uh, focusing on TLR9. Unfortunately, those studies were not successful and uh, didn't uh, progress. Uh, but here we see that, um, you know, with increased defensins, the elafins and the, the, you know, the NAPs, the elafins and the SLPIs, there are a number of different effects on different chemo, uh, uh, different uh, physiologic effects on different effector cells. So I show you these things to, so that you're aware of the active uh, immune, innate immune response. Uh, other players, obviously, complement activation, effector NK cells, which promote immunologic tolerance during pregnancy. It's important for protecting the fetus from infection. And then now, what about mast cells? And um, uh, they, they, you can also find mast cells in the, uh, in the general tract as well, and it's still not clear all of their roles, uh, but uh, we'll talk more about some conditions that might have mast cell-mediated um, uh, responses. Now, in the male, uh, again, uh, the innate immune responses are they're most pronounced in the ejaculate. Again, this is important uh, to have these responses to protect spermatozoa. Uh, the seminal fluid is rich in potassium, zinc, citric acid, fructose, a number of different uh, chemicals, spermine, uh, free amino acids, prostaglandins, uh, of course, PSA, which is also a marker for other uh, you know conditions including prostate cancer enzyme other enzymes uh, lysozyme pepsinogen alpha amylase beta glucuronidase plasminogen activators we do know that zinc is a prostate antibacterial factor and also binds to several proteins including PSA and when it 
absent uh, sperm chromatin uh, stability is affected, leading to decreased uh, fertility. Uh, seminal plasma also is uh, rich with IgG, IgA, and C3. The role of prostaglandins, they have very strong stimulatory as well as inhibitory effects on smooth muscle. Uh, PGE2 can modify dendritic function. Uh, it can affect differentiation, maturation, and might Migration. It increases production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, and also increases expression of MHC class II molecules as well as TLR expression. And also can activate nuclear factor kappa base signaling, obviously resulting in increased cytokine responses. Uh, PSA is a serine calocrine inhibitor, important for clotting and lysis of clotted ejaculates. It's, a, as I mentioned, a marker for prostate cancer, but also activates peripheral blood mononuclear cells, resulting in increased secretion of interferon gamma by NK cells. And then semigelin is a substrate for PSA. It's really not clear what its function and, uh, uh, and mechanism of action are, but uh, improper degradation uh, can lead to decreased sperm motility and decreased fertility. Uh, PSA uh, cleaves semigelin, leading to se uh, semen uh, liquefaction and sp increased sperm motility. <clears throat> now, what about the adaptive immune responses? Let's address those briefly, And because in the female uh, general tract, it, it does not have an organized lymphoid tissue. It possesses uh, uh, antigen-presenting cells that express MHC class II molecules that are under strong hormonal control. Uh, the endocervical, uterine, and fallopian tube epithelial elicit site-specific immune responses, leading to increased cytokine and chemokine responses, which protect from infection and, again, protect the ovum from uh, during implantation and pregnancy. Uh, uh, when you uh, inter there's there's evidence showing that uh, an interaction between pathogens and hormones influence the genital microenvironment by either favoring induction of immunity or by promoting uh, viral invasion. Uh, for one example, HIV uses the CCR5 chemokine uh, co-receptor to facilitate infection, women taking oral contraceptives, which increase the CCR5 expression on uh, CD4 uh, cells, and that may, that may increase their risk for HIV viral tra uh, transmission. So there is some data to support that, that interaction. There we go. There's also um, cell-mediated adaptive immune responses of, you know, so for instance, AD, AD, uh, antibody-dependent cell cytotoxic uh, toxicity of chlamydia infected epithelial cells may provide anti-HIV protection in humans. Uh, specific CD8 T cells in the cervix of HIV-infected women may uh, function as specific uh, cytotoxic T cells or by producing interferon gamma that promotes antiviral activity. Uh, and women, for instance, with uh, pelvic inflammatory disease or recurrent chlamydia tr uh, trachomatous uh, uh, infections have decreased interfering gamma production in response to a heat shock protein 60, which is not seen in women who have fewer infections. So um, now in the male, uh, adaptive immune responses, most T cells are CD8 suppressor cytotoxic cells, and they're located along with macrophages in the epithelium and lamina propria, the vas deferens, the epididymis, and the reed testes. Uh, interferon gamma-producing activated T cells are potent inducers of the MHC class II antigen expression on antigen-presenting cells. Uh, increased CD8 T cells are present along regions where the blood testes barrier is weakest and may serve to suppress immune responses to sperm-specific antigens, trying to prevent this, these autoantibodies from forming. Uh, in contrast, increased CD4 T cells are present in the general tract in semen of men with spermatozoa autoantibodies. So I wanted to give that background to show that the female and male uh, re uh, reproductive tracts are uh, 
very enriched with both innate and adaptive immune responses. Of course, not surprisingly, this is these are very important organ systems for reproduction, and that's what their primary purpose is, is to protect uh, the spermatozoa and protect the ovum uh, so that there could be successful uh, fertilization and plantation and uh, ultimately uh, uh, to, you know, healthy healthy baby uh, down the road. Uh, so let's talk about clinical conditions now that involve the female and male genital tracts. And I think that what you'll see here is that we still have a lot of unanswered questions about some of these conditions mechanistically and how it pertains to both adaptive and innate immune responses. The common conditions that one might see would be autoimmune conditions, uh, namely reactive arthritis, uh, which is, you know, a non-gonococcal urethritis, uh, which is associated with non-gonococcal uh, urethritis, conjunctivitis arthritis. Um, again, this is thought to be uh, caused most commonly by chlamydia, uh, trachomatis, okay, most common cause cause of urethritis and cervicitis. Uh, Bichette's, again, is another condition which we may, may or may not see. We see these cases periodically, recurrent episodic oral and genital ulcerations of the scrotum and penis in men, and then the cervix and vulva region in women. And again, there's increased CD8 T gamma delta cells, and it located in, in, in the uh, in, in HLA-B51 uh, region of susceptible individuals. Um, but we still don't know a lot about uh, what is causing uh, Bichette's. Uh, but the more common conditions you'll see uh, would be IgE-mediated conditions, and these would include seminal plasma hypersensitivity, candida vulvovaginal hypersensitivity, and progestin hypersensitivity. There are some other uh, rare or less common conditions, burning semen syndrome and post-orgasmic illness syndrome, which have been, uh, you know, in the literature in the last maybe decade or so, uh, which I'll briefly mention. So let's pivot and talk about a few cases. And case study one is a 37-year-old female who's been married for eight years who presents with localized vaginal burning and pain with contact, after contact with seminal fluid, which began immediately after her first first pregnancy. Her symptoms progressed to bronchospasm with cough and she subsequently developed more severe systemic symptoms consisting of diffuse itching, wheezing, shortness of breath, flushing, facial swelling, and hives. On three occasions, she experienced loss of consciousness with convulsions that occurred within 30 minutes after unprotected intercourse. After the third event, the association between these episodes and unprotected sexual intercourse was finally established. Her past history as was uh, there was no family there's no history of drug allergies no history of food allergy to red or uh, green to red and green peppers I guess she had included she thought that you know she has a history of food allergy to red and green peppers which she uh, gets nausea and vomiting with headaches but there was no relationship between uh, the episodes and eating these uh, foods uh, no sex transmitted diseases <clears throat> one child uh, she had uh, and no miscarriages or uh, she had a history of seasonal allergies and a cat allergy and she was told she had asthma but never was physician diagnosed and she was taking no medication she has a husband with food allergies to mushrooms uh, but otherwise is very healthy so what's the differential diagnosis? Well, again, the top of the list should be seminal plasma hypersensitivity based on this uh, history. However, uh, other conditions that one could consider might be seasonal allergic vulvovaginitis, recurrent allergic vulvovaginitis, although this does not result in anaphylaxis. Uh, seminal plasma transfer of a drug or drug metabolite to a drug sensitive in patient, uh, but this is not present in this particular case. Seminal plasma transfer of food allergens to a food allergic uh, female. So in this situation, one would have to see if the male was eating mushrooms and if the female was sensitized to mushrooms or such as that, but again, not likely in this case. Uh, of course, ruling out other types of infectious diseases, especially with localized some plasma hypersensitivity. It's very important. Contact dermatitis, especially with the localized form of seminal plasma hypersensitivity. Of course, structural problems can cause localized vaginal uh, vulvovaginitis and pain, dyspareunia, uh, and then certainly physically induced symptoms like exercise or vibratory angioedema. Again, these are less likely. 
So what is uh, seminal plasma hypersensitivity? Well, systemic seminal plasma hypersensitivity presents with symptoms of diffuse hives, facial tongue lip, throat angioedema, with or without stridor, wheezing, diarrhea, and in most extreme situations, vascular collapse, as we saw in this patient. Uh, localized uh, is uh, associated with immediate post vulvovaginal burning and pain, and this may this is often very severe. It's uh, described by patients as a thousand needles being stuck in their vagina, and it can persist for hours or days. There may be overlap. Patients with systemic uh, anaphylaxis, so stomach hypersensitivity, uh, plasma hypersensitivity may have localized symptoms. Now, the gold standard is that <clears throat> for both types, symptoms are completely alleviated by the use of a condom. It's very important. And you ask if they donned the condom before having uh, any type of intercourse. Uh, so sometimes people put it on before ejaculation, and that, but there may be a leakage, and that would still cause some clinical symptoms. The prevalence is unknown, but it's estimated somewhere between 20 and 40,000 women have this condition. We have a website, and we get you know, questionnaires completed on a regular basis. Uh, there was a one a point a, a show with Phil Donahue. Many may not remember this. Uh, he was a popular daytime show host, and he had um, uh, the case of a patient with um, uh, seminal plasma sensitivity. And as a result of that, there were several uh, letters, uh, there were several requests for more information uh, from the, their viewers, and questionnaire surveys were actually sent out, and 1,073 uh, completed surveys were were. Um, returned actually and uh, which is a very low response uh, and but an even lower response uh, had pro what probable seminal plasma hypersensitivity based on complete resolution of symptoms with use of a condom but not confirmed so if one extrapolated that to 100 million sexually active women in the United States that comes out to be about 29,000 so that's very rough but it, you know it's one way you can extrapolate a prevalence so these are some studies that looked at uh, comparisons between localized and systemic, and one was back in 1997, and a subsequent review was in 2011. And again, uh, what was really of uh, not not uh, notable in the first review was that uh, the onset of first time, uh, the onset of symptoms with first time intercourse was more common in the uh, women with localized seminal plasma hypersensitivity compared to systemic. Uh, and there was a, um, and food allergy was slightly higher uh, in um, women uh, with systemic symptoms. Now in the follow-up, uh, there were some differences with respect to age uh, and duration of symptoms uh, between the uh, systemic and localized receptors, uh, 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 localized uh, reactors. Uh, there was, uh, and there was some, uh, perhaps some uh, differences were, were systemic uh, reactors had a higher uh, percent, high, higher percentage of dog sensitization. Uh, but other than that, uh, the other uh, differences that were originally defined, the food allergy, and uh, were not as um, uh, uh, were not prevalent. So again, it really determines the size of the population, and uh, these are relatively small numbers overall. So uh, there's not a lot of there wasn't a lot of concordance between these different surveys. So this is just showing a characterization that, uh, not surprisingly, the patients with localized uh, who had localized symptoms had more of deep pain, burning, redness. Um, uh, but again, uh, blisters and, and rash were uh, probably reported a little bit more by systemic reactors, uh, and uh, but were less common compared to the other symptoms. And then looking at the systemic reactors, you can see that most common symptom was generalized itching with less that followed by hives and some other uh, respiratory issues. But um, and unconsciousness, losing unconsciousness, it's extremely rare, and we've never had a reported death from seminal plasma hypersensitivity. 
Now, we had done some work to look at uh, differences between the immune responses in systemic versus, versus localized seminal plasma hypersensitivity, and uh, generally speaking, localized uh, uh, seminal plasma hypersensitivity is not an IgE-mediated response uh, where at, compared to systemic, where you can measure specific Ig responses to different seminal plasma proteins. Uh, again, we can see uh, in panel B, this is looking at uh, inhibition assays uh, and to the whole seminal plasma versus different fractions of seminal plasma, and BSA is a control, and you can see that there is inhibition um, uh, to these different uh, proteins uh, <coughs> in the uh, seminal fluid. Uh, and then we also uh, see that um, the... Um, uh, these are two different patients, by the way, in panel B. That's what we're showing, patient one and patient different, two different patients. And in panel C, these are basophil activation tests, the beta-hexaminidase uh, assay. And you can see that uh, compared, there's no difference in, in histamine release uh, in localized seminal plasma hypersensitivity compared to normals, uh, whereas systemic, uh, they have much higher uh, uh, histamine release. So we, this is ways that we were able to show that, in general, uh, the uh, likely that these patients, uh, if you do testing to seminal fluid and localized seminal plasma hypersensitivity, many times it will be negative but or equivocal. Uh, not to say it can't be positive, but it's not like systemic where you see positive uh, specific Ig to seminal plasma protein. So this is just comparing. Uh, these cases and how they present clinically, the types of symptoms, both of them will resolve with the use of condom. Uh, I mentioned uh, skin prick testing, whole seminal fluid is generally negative uh, uh, in patients with localized, um, as is the specific IgE, uh, but basal, as is basophil activation uh, uh, is, is also negative in these patients. Now, interestingly, we also looked at T cell uh, subsets and looked at shifting uh, before and after desensitization in patients with seminal fluid, and we see that uh, there is a clear shift of uh, Th2 to Th1 type cells in patients with systemic uh, hypersensitivity, which is not seen in, in the localized reactors. Now, interestingly, both of these groups re respond uh, to uh, some form of uh, desensitization to seminal fluid. And and the question is, it's, it, we understand, you know, for the most part, mechanisms for systemic reactors, but why do localized seminal plasma hypersensitivity patients respond to integrated uh, 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 intravaginal graded uh, challenges to whole seminal fluid dilutions. Uh, it's also important to note that both uh, groups, they can conceive uh, that fertility is not a complication of seminal fluid hypersensitivity. Uh, this is just showing the uh, uh, a, a Western blot uh, for uh, looking at the proteins that are involved, and we can see that uh, PSA is the uh, 32 kilodalton band, it's, 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 uh, which has um, been identified as being one of the major proteins um, in uh, seminal, pl seminal uh, plasma hypersensitivity, and the 10 kilodalton is a fragment, we think, of the PSA. But uh, so this is just looking at different patients and they're uh, producing the uh, and the antibody response to um, uh, the PSA. Now, there's a question whether there's cross-reactivity with other common allergens may explain symptoms, because many of these women, as I showed you, have, uh, have symptoms right after first-time intercourse, never having had exposure, never having had uh, any type of seminal fluid exposure. And this is seen in about 30 to 40 percent of women, um, more so in the localized than the systemic reactors. Uh, so it suggests the existence of a cross-reactive pre-sensitizing uh, allergen. Uh, some investigators have reported cross-reactivity among dog, dog dander proteins and PSA. In fact, dog PSA is very homogeneous to human PSA. Um, so the question is, there is some kind of similar response as pollen food allergy syndrome? But again, this has never been demonstrated, and it's uh, many women that we see who have these manifestations have no animals, have no sensitization to dogs, and uh, 
and have never never owned a pet. So I don't think that this really explains what's going on. This is just showing a dendrogram, showing the relationship between different serine proteases and showing how there's strong uh, correlation, strong homology between PSA, human PSA, and dog PSA. So, uh, so we still don't quite understand what is causing, uh, you know, why women become sensitized, and, and uh, but you know, likely due to some uh, defect in innate or adaptive immune responses in their reproductive tract that we went through. But again, very difficult to investigate in and, 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 and humans, and we don't have a mouse model uh, to investigate this. Uh, so the treatment is avoidance and using a condom is as recommended. Uh, antihistamines, uh, whether you know H1 and H2 blockers, leukotriene modifying agents, they're often ineffective. Uh, again, we now use graded intravaginal challenge using whole seminal fluid dilutions. This is a first line treatment. It's usually very effective. It's less time consuming less expensive and easy to administer in your office. We recently published a manuscript in Jackie in Practice, which is more or less a how-to uh, guide for treating women with seminal plasma hypersensitivity. Uh, now, in cases where these women don't respond, we have done subcutaneous desensitization to relevant seminal plasma proteins. So taking the whole seminal fluid, fractionating it, isolating the seminal, uh, the, the different uh, proteins, and then testing to see which specific protein the, the woman is sensitized to, and then doing subcutaneous desensitization to those proteins, of course, after sterilizing them and filtering them to make sure there's no uh, bacteria or other, you know, my microbes in the seminal fluid. So it's a, it's a labor-intensive process to do, and this is what we were actually doing before we started uh, recognizing that, you know, just doing intravaginal graded challenges was, as it was very effective in the vast majority of patients. This is just showing a fractionation using a HP, uh, you know, FPLC uh, column uh, and showing the different fractions that, you know, occur uh, when you, when you uh, molecular weight uh, proteins that come off the, uh, the column. And I just wanted to just show this diagram because this was showing how um, when we looked at uh, treatment uh, before and after in women with uh, systemic and localized seminal plasma hypersensitivity, you can see that before, this is the, uh, this is looking at interfering gamma producing CD4 T cells, you can see that before they're lower, after treatment, they go up in these two patients who have systemic, these are systemic uh, seminal plasma hypersensitivities versus the localized, there's really essentially no change. We see a very modest change in IL-4 producing CD4 cells where there's a reduction in this patient. This is one of the systemic reactors. This is another one where there's a slight decrease, but no decreased differences in the uh, localized reactors. And again, this is just further illustrating this, the absolute cell numbers uh, before and after treatment in systemic reactors versus local. You see increased CD4 gamma interferon producing cells and decreased, uh, some modest decreases in CD4 IL-4 cells. I mentioned that fertility is not an issue. This is one of our, the babies from one of our patients. Uh, they like to send pictures. Uh, and uh, there have been uh, cases where intrauterine insemination using wash spermatozoa have been done successfully to remove sensitizing proteins in vitro fertilization. But most of our patients can go through natural intercourse and have, you know, post-desensitization and have normal, healthy children. Um, so I, I, there was a, uh, back in the, uh, after the first, uh, Iran uh, uh, conflict, uh, Gulf War, the first Gulf War uh, in the early 90s, there were a group of veterans who were experiencing something called burning semen syndrome. Uh, and they, again, these some cases, the their sexual partners uh, developed localized vaginal burning and pain. Uh, so there was a, a, an RFA, which we applied for and received to investigate this problem. And again, we uh, did a, you know, a qualitative as well as uh, we tried to do some additional, uh, you know, uh, translational work to try to understand what was going on with these patients. And uh, 
we it was a very difficult uh, population to investigate because they were spread out throughout the United States and generally throughout the world, and we had very little information on anything clinically. Uh, this is well before EM uh, electronic medical records. These were still everything was paper charts and uh, very difficult. Uh, uh, but we were finally able to evaluate uh, 188 of these veterans who had suspected uh, uh, burning semen syndrome. Um, and uh, less than 50% of their sexual partners had resolution of symptoms after use of a condom, ex which excluded seminal plasma hypersensitivity. Now, interestingly, when we divided the questionnaire response into healthy with versus unhealthy groups, unhealthy meaning they had all kinds of comorbidities um, based on the absence of these multiple physical symptoms, uh, we were able to reveal a significant correlation between the unhealthy group and PTSD. Uh, but uh, we did find several couples who were in the healthy group who met criteria of seminal plasma hypersensitivity that actually were treated. Uh, and three couples had complete resolution of symptoms. One had partial resolution and one was not responsive. So, so it, it was an interesting study uh, showing that a subset, very small subset, had actually seminal plasma hypersensitivity, but we never really did quite understand what was causing this condition. And it, the study was hindered by poor case definition of the underlying problem, multiple concomitant somatic and psychological symptoms here, hindering a focused evaluation, and then, of course, logistical difficulties in evaluating uh, geographically dispersed individuals throughout the study. And uh, so, it, at least in some patients, it was possibly a, a, a variant of local iseminal plasma hypersensitivity. So what are the proposed mechanisms for systemic and localized seminal plasma hypersensitivity? Well, here you see that, uh, you know, there are numerous proteases like PSA. Uh, again, PSA is inhibited by zinc, uh, which, um, uh, you know, it is important for activating PAR receptors uh, and other PAR, you know, PAR2 as well as other PAR receptors, which can de degrade tight junctions if they're left unhindered, and these can result in, um, uh, uh, you know, increased uh, production of um, uh, cyto certain cytokines and also prostaglandin E2, uh, which could lead to um, uh, uh, some of the actual localized symptoms that women are experiencing due to the disruption of the uh, vaginal uh, epithelial barrier uh, from these uh, PAR receptors. Of course, the the systemic um, uh, form is easily explained, uh, if, you know, in the tradition. IgE mediate sensitization that allergenic that uh, PSA is uh, processed by uh, naive T cells. It's broken, you know, again after being taken up by dendritic cells and produced uh, and introduced to TH uh, naive cells, uh, naive T cells that then is uh, differentiate the TH2 cells that can release cytokines that can drive this uh, uh, cause B cell activation, proliferation, and production isotype switching for specific Ig. Responses. So, we certainly uh, see the traditional Ig response for uh, and res uh, 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 mechanism in response to PSA. So, but it, we still don't quite understand the localized mechanism, and this is still a theoretical uh, mechanism. We have looked at zinc levels to see if they were decreased in these patients. Uh, in the males of these patients, which were not. We didn't see any evidence of that. So, um, but more work is needed to really quite understand the uh, mechanisms. So let's move to case study two, and this is a 28-year-old female that presents with recurrent vulvovaginal yeast infections confirmed by culture, uh, response to the topical on systemic antifungal agents, but infections reoccur. It's very debilitating, causing significant interpersonal strain on her current relationship. Uh, her past medical history is unmarked for diabetes, use of oral contraception or hormones, uh, hormone replacement therapy, uh, and no use of antibiotics. And her symptoms persisted regardless of the use of a condom donned before intercourse. Uh, she had evidence of specific I as well as skin prick tests to Canada albicons that were both positive. So this is a case that we see not infrequently, and if you ask patients about this, you know, the, 
this is a big this is a big problem for many women chronic bulbar vaginal candida hypersensitivity and 75 percent of females experience at least one yeast infection and recurrent infections are more common in women again with these underlying conditions like diabetes oral con taking oral contraceptives or or or, or, and, or when taking antibiotics but these are uh, most women have no recognizable risk factors and the pathogenesis is unclear it may be due to abnormal macrophage responses to candida albicans resulting in increased pg2 which inhibits lymphocyte responses to candida uh, it has anti candida albicans ig antibodies and pg2 are increased in vaginal fluid of women with recurrent vaginal candidiasis uh, and vaginal hypersensitivity to candida albicans may be again caused by increased levels as, uh, of the PG2, uh, which can suppress localized vaginal cell mediated immune responses, resulting in yeast colonization and recurring infection. So, so I think that that's some of the popular theories of how this is occurring. Um, the uh, so to, to diagnose it again, um, it's important to have culture proven, uh, no well, other underlying causes. Again, these patients uh, may respond to topical or systemic antifungal ther uh, therapy temporarily, but uh, it comes back. So it's not uh, persist. It, 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 it doesn't uh, resolve the problem. And you can measure specific IgE. So <laughs> one early study by Jim Metzger's group from East Carolina treated 18 women with recurrent vaginal candidiasis with subcutaneous immunotherapy, two candida albicons, and they identified that 79% of these women experienced a decrease in the mean number of vaginitis episodes after one year of treatment. And there's certainly been other case reports or case series that have confirmed these observations. However, as of yet, there's been no double-blind placebo-controlled study because there's hard to get funding for something there's no intellectual property for. Um, this is looking at a series of cases we've treated and um, again um, uh, these uh, uh, women all had uh, diagnoses of um, Canada hypersensitivity. They all had positive cultures. They had um, uh, either skin uh, uh, positive skin test either by prick or intracutaneous that were positive um, but um, some of these cases they had somewhat equivocal test results uh, but uh, uh, they had no other underlying explanation for this uh, for their condition uh, they underwent uh, desensitization, and again, quantitatively, there was a significant reduction in many cases from uh, you know very symptomatic to no symptoms, uh, or or significantly uh, reduced symptoms after receiving relatively low dose uh, concentrations of immunotherapy. So it's almost like an example of low zone tolerance to some extent. And they don't require high dose immunotherapy to exhibit the response. In fact, some women, when you push them with high doses, they even get worse. So, uh, very effective. Um, you find a person who has this problem and treat them; they'll love you forever when you when you take care of their problem. So, it is very gratifying uh, to treat, and uh, something that should be in the differential when you uh, uh, women who present with uh, chronic vulvovaginal issues. Now, the third study is a 35-year-old healthy male presents with a constellation of symptoms, including low-grade temperatures, generalized fatigue, malaise, severe memory and concentration difficulties occurring immediately after ejaculations, which last five to seven days. Onset of symptoms <coughs> one year uh, began one year prior to the present to their presentation. Uh, Past medical history was unremarkable. There's no history of allergies or asthma. They had a sexual partner without any symptoms. And uh, treatment with NSAIDs and antihistamines over the counter did not help alleviate these symptoms. So this is referring to a case called post-orgasmic illness syndrome, which many of you might have heard about. They do pop up here and there. In 2002, men began reporting severe fatigue, low-grade fevers, upper respiratory symptoms, concentration difficulties, irritability, and flu-like symptoms. After ejaculation, the criteria they they developed. Uh, criteria based on 45 men with this uh, POIS, uh, which, you know, talked about duration, uh, you know, occurrence, it, it was more, and it occurred in more than 90% of ejaculation events and manifesting as this flu-like state. Um, 
and again, as, as, as quickly as it comes on, it spontaneously resolves. In some cases, niacin has been shown to be helpful. Um, there are two case reports of males who have been desensitized to their own semen. This is very concerning because, uh, you know, there's a, you, know, you could be introducing autoantibodies uh, to these individuals, so it's not something that's, that we advocate. Uh, and that's really about all we know about this condition right now. It's whether this is just something that is a, uh, you know, some type of cytokine storm, whether it's, you know, interferon, uh, increased interferon release, or it's, it's not clear. Uh, and very little uh, research, to my knowledge, is going on related to this condition at the present time. Uh, uh, so the final case is a case of uh, autoimmune progesterone dermatitis, which is also known as uh, progestin hypersensitivity. And this is a 26-year-old female with the six-month history of oligomenorrhea and polycystic ovarian disease who presents with facial angioedema, bronchospasm, and hypotension within two days of starting orthonovum. Uh, which is an estrogen progesterone combination. It was prescribed to prevent recurrence of rupturing cysts. The oral contraceptive pill is discontinued for one week and restarted two weeks later, resulting in a similar reaction. Uh, three subsequent reactions over a two-month period, each uh, uh, with increasing intensity and duration, were observed. Uh, history revealed the occurrence of premenstrual urticaria and angioedema. She was tested to different uh, agents, uh, including progesterone, pregnant, adalol, estradiol, norethadrine, and so forth. These were all negative. She did have leukocyte histamine release that demonstrated positive response to the 5-beta pregnenolol diol, which decreased uh, uh, four months uh, after discontinuing oral contraception. Uh, her condition completely resolved, however, she, she really, at that time, this was years ago, uh, they treated her with a, a, a topical gonadotropin-releasing hormone uh, inhibitor, uh, uh, nephrolin, and, uh, and uh, her symptoms completely resolved uh, uh, for the duration of, the, of her uh, until she actually became postmenopausal, at which point... Uh, this treatment was able to be discontinued. She didn't have any real side effects from it. <laughs> and uh, so that was one of the uh, early cases uh, of, um, uh, of uh, progesterone hypersensitivity. Uh, here's a biopsy, histopathology, which shows some accumulation of lymphocytes uh, in the dermis, but again, and really nonspecific and is consistent with either a drug reaction, but one can see this with autoimmune progesterone dermatitis. Uh, there are many different presentations. You can have anaphylactoid reactions with hives, angioedema, and other uh, that, get, that can occur premenstrual, or something called catamenial. Um, there can also be a whole host of dermatologic mucosal reactions, uh, stomatitis, eczema, E. multiforme, fixed drug ruptions, folliculitis, vesicular, uh, vesicular bolus reaction. So a number of different skin eruptions. In fact, we just saw a patient today, this morning from New York City, who presented with um, a, like a chronic dermatitis of the face that was uh, uh, correlated very well with the, pre, with the onset of her, men, uh, which began approximately five days before her menstrual cycle and stopped one to two days within the menstrual cycle. So... Uh, we'll see if she has elevated Ig antibody to progesterone. Now, catamenial anaphylaxis varies from uh, uh, autoimmune progesterone dermatitis or progestin hypersensitivity by the timing of symptoms. It begins at the start of the menstrual flow and continues throughout the menstrual flow, and symptoms stops when the menstrual flow stops. And it's thought to be that uh, endometrial derived mediators such as PGF2 alpha may leak into the systemic circulation, causing these reactions. In some cases, non steroidals like in the methicin has been helpful. Skin testing and intramuscular hormone challenge tests are usually negative and again uh, in severe cases bilateral sal salpingoforectomy has been used which resolves symptoms but we don't advocate that uh, for treatment of these patients there's some other things that could be done before that and this is just showing the heterogeneity presentation of skin eruptions that can occur in patients with progestin hypersensitivity so it's not only just hives and angioedema uh, 
So the diagnosis is made by a good history, cyclic skin lesions related to the menstrual cycle. Onset usually in, is in adult life after menarche, but can occur and worsen during pregnancy. Uh, symptoms start three to 10 days before the premenstrual flow and cease one to two days in the menses, although it can continue throughout the menstrual period, making it very difficult sometimes to differentiate this from you know, catamenial uh, uh, anaphylaxis or catamenial uh, reactions. Uh, skin manifestations uh, uh, can occur with or without systemic manifestations. Uh, examination, there's different uh, presentation of skin rashes present, as I showed you, in different morphologic forms. And the, right now, we think the best way to at least look for specific Ig is through a positive uh, 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 immunoassay, a, a progesterone immunoassay, which we developed in our laboratory at the University of Cincinnati, which is very specific for progesterone. Other tests, you know, like progesterone skin test is limited because progesterone is not water soluble. It is in, immersed in liquid, I mean, oil. So oil is a very irritating um, <clears throat> material, so it can lead to false positive responses. But certainly there's not a good correlation with progesterone testing and, and diagnosis. Um, one could do oral or intramuscular challenge. Conscious progesterone, of course, this is not always desirable by the patient because it causes uh, undue, uh, you know, uh, symptoms, untoward, the symptoms that they're not willing to experience or don't want to experience. Um, of course, basal activation tests could also be done, but they're more labor intensive. And uh, so the uh, uh, tests I was talking about, um, the ELISA has been developed, and uh, I'm just going to show you some data from the a specific IG to progesterone assay that was published. The results were published in Annals of Allergy a couple years ago, and this is just showing different patients who present and healthy controls on the far right, negative uh, specific IG responses in patients who had uh, thought they might have had progesterone progesterone hypersensitivity versus patients with lower levels versus people who have higher levels. And we did show inhibition uh, to uh, these, again, using pooled uh, serum uh, in these uh, patients who are positive. There's significant inhibition. This is looking at, uh, a, uh, on the left, a pooled group, and I think on the right is a patient, a sp one patient, uh, and you see there's very strong inhibition. Uh, and then we also looked at beta hexaminidase assays to show histamine release, and one can see that uh, compared to um, the uh, non-atopic or negative controls, uh, that the patients who had um, high specific Ig to progesterone had significant basin that fill histamine release. Uh, and this is also seen in patients to some extent with lower. Uh, levels as well. So there is a, um, uh, you know, there are there is a, a spectrum of, of positive results. Of course, when you do these tests, you always have to uh, correlate them in the context of the patient's history uh, and their exposure to interpret them. No test is purely diagnostic. It's, it's supportive. So how do we um, evaluate these individuals? How do we treat them? Again, this is just looking at um, uh, one proposed algorithm, uh, if you suspect the condition, you know, if, again, we don't really believe skin testing is the way to go. Serologic testing is available. We're trying to commercialize the assay uh, as we speak with IBT. They're certainly uh, working towards uh, uh, developing the assay uh, to make it more uh, readily available for, uh, for everyone to use, uh, for patients to use. If it's if the testing is negative, uh, obviously you want to consider alternative uh, diagnoses. But if it's positive, then you really need to reassess the patient's goals. And if they're, uh, you know, not having too much trouble with their symptoms and, you know, basically the standard medical management. Uh, if, you know, again, if they want to get pregnant, uh, you know, one could possibly do in vitro fertilization. However, uh, desensitization is something that is feasible, and there are oral as well as IM and intravaginal uh, protocols uh, to desensitize, and many women do well on that on those protocols, but some still have breakthrough issues or have reactions, and we have to try other things to attenuate those reactions. Some have reported the use of, we've actually had similar success using omalizumab as a way of actually attenuating uh, 
the response uh, to uh, the reactions related to uh, 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 desensitization in some situations. These are the treatment options again uh, with uh, most of them are not great. Uh, Shutting down the menstrual cycle is not only therapeutic, it's also diagnostic, except you can't keep uh, women, you can't suppress them with these uh, gonadotropin releasing agonists for um, long periods of time. Uh, people have used tamoxifen, um, they've tried using androgens. Uh, again, oophorectomy is a last resort, um, and uh, desensitization seems to work in, in a good percentage of these patients. And, Normally, we start off with an oral desensitization protocol and see how that goes, but uh, we try to work in conjunction with their gynecologists and in terms of, uh, as most of these women are re living remote and not in the greater Cincinnati area. These are examples of protocols for uh, desensitization. You can see some are, you know, based on oral, some are based on, uh, in, you know, uh, intramuscular injections and so forth. So, uh, in conclusion, allergists should be familiar with allergic disorders involving the reproductive systems in women and men. Uh, clinical pre presentations can be quite variable. Uh, diagnostic tests ha has limitations for some conditions, uh, although we're making progress with progesterone hypersensitivity. Uh, we still need to understand more about the pathomechanisms of localized seminal plasma hypersensitivity and this post-orgasmic illness syndrome. Uh, and again, uh, treatment for most of these conditions is usually very successful, except, uh, except for the POIS. We still don't have a good uh, treatment uh, for these individuals. So, so that's what I have to say. I, you know, I think there's a lot, the, the, it's a lot, to, there's a lot to um, still learn, gaps in knowledge, and, uh, but I hope that you have at least got some kind of overview of the more common problems that we might see in your practice and I'll take any questions if you have them. Uh, thank, uh, you, thank you, David, that was great. Jonathan. Oh, Jonathan, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, um, um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Bernstein? Um, I have a, a couple um, questions. Um, first, uh, how many, you were talking about, you know, the scope of practice, but um, how many patients um, with fertility issues and issues that you described this morning um, do you, in your practice, see, and do you, um, um, you know, advertise to see these, or are these just people that come in because they've been referred to an allergist or think an allergist may help them? Well, most of these patients are self-referred because their obstetrician gynecologists don't uh, really help them that much. Some of them are good and they read the literature and they can look up cases and things of that nature. I think most of the time when you have a complex case, it's amazing what you can learn when you do some uh, investigative research <laughs> about things you don't know. Uh, so, but most of them are self-referred because they have problems. They have long, torturous journeys. No one seems to listen to them. Uh, so we don't typically advertise for this, okay? This is something that is, the advertisement would be PubMed uh, or whatever, you know, patients post, which I don't review. Uh, but, um, you know, I think most of the work that, you know, anything else, we see these patients because they, they, they're trying to find someone who can help them. Uh, we do have a questionnaire survey that we have on our website uh, or that we have on a seminal plasma hypersensitivity website just that uh, people can answer just uh, and that helps us try to identify some prevalence uh, and we do get uh, patients filling those out uh, not infrequently and determine if they want to be further evaluated but um, so uh, but that's you know I think that it, you know, these are probably more common than you realize, and uh, especially Canada vulvovaginal hypersensitivity. I'm sure that's much more common. That's something that's totally overlooked, where we could make an impact on treating that. Um, so, um, but yeah, that's that's what happens. I think, like anything else. Um, um, I, the second question, extra, um, is in regards to what you just mentioned. The uh, candidiasis, um, 
I remember about probably, I don't know, six or seven years ago, I was at the Academy meeting looking at abstracts, and there was an abstract, I believe, from Vanderbilt um, that a fellow presented where they had about 15 or 20 patients who had chronic oral catadiasis uh, and that they had tried everything to get rid of it. Um, and they actually um, found out that um, I believe that there was some kind of like an antibacterial or some kind of agent that was commonly put in toothpaste, I think some mouthwashes that people were using, and they um, actually removed that. They gave them, you know, they had them use products that didn't have these, this chemical in it, and I can't remember what the name of the chemical was, um, and actually they were able to clear their, um, their oral canadiasis. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was curious um, um, if any if the the chronic vulval candidiasis was um, maybe related to you know feminine hygiene products or or soaps or things like that 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 may change the microbiome um, and has anybody ever looked at that sort of stuff? So, so other than asking about that in their history, you know, uh, are they using any feminine napkins or feminine other feminine hygiene products? Are they douching or things of that nature? Uh, uh, I don't, you know, there that does not. That seem that's that's something that should be included in the history, and I think that you, that's an important point because you can easily disrupt the innate immune responses, as we saw, uh, which could cause uh, overgrowth of yeast and other uh, microbes. Uh, so, <clears throat> I think that's an important element to include in the history. But in the cases of the patients that you saw today, these were not uh, the, these were were not uh, uh, things the women were doing. Uh, you know, uh, that resulted in these recurrent infections. They're pretty much not doing anything because they don't know how to stop it. So they they, they do. They're not having intercourse. They're not doing anything. So it's a, it's quite an it's quite a, a big problem uh, in from inter an interpersonal uh, relationship uh, perspective. But that's an interesting observation with the oral, which is, a, you know, not surprising. Yeah, and I can't remember what the what the the um, um, the substance was. Um, there was, um, I just I can't remember what it was. But mm -hmm. I was trying to when you were talking, I tried to look it up on Google. But I know it was uh, um, one of the fellows at Vanderbilt had presented this. Um, um, this abstract, um, mm -hmm. which I can't yeah, remember say. that too. Yeah, I kind of recall that as well. Um, so, anyways, um, well, it's after the it's after we're busy, and we appreciate you taking the time today um, um, to speak with us. Um, and um, you have a great weekend, and thanks again for um, being part of Cola. Thank you, and have a good weekend. And uh, hopefully, uh, uh, this was helpful. Take care. Yes, thanks. Bye-bye.